I'd love to see all of you here and to worship together. Many of you men were with us for this men's conference we had the last two days, over 250 guys together, Friday and Saturday, worshiping God. So it was a, just been a great weekend so far, and it's not done yet. I want to take a minute before we launch into the sermon this morning and just to let you know, we talk around here about generosity, meaning that generosity is, uh, we reflect God's heart. God is a generous God. The central tenet of our faith is that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's a radical act of generosity. It's why we sing. That's why we're here to worship. And we reflect his heart when we're generous. And I think it's easy to slip into a scarcity mindset. And so we believe that generosity is good for our soul. It honors God and it moves his mission through the church forward. And so to those of you that are regularly generous to the work of God here, we're grateful. I want to say thank you for your giving. It's making a difference. If you're new here, we don't want you to feel pressure at all to give. But uh, there's lots of ways we can give. I want to tell you a story uh, about what our generosity produces. Because sometimes I think maybe you don't hear that enough. We have, if you don't know, Chapel Street Church is a family of neighborhood churches. Four physical campuses, lots of different worshiping congregations. But over on North Aurora campus, our most recent campus, God has been working on a Sunday night outreach ministry to, to, youth, to a bunch of youth from the community who don't have much church background at all. You'll see an image here on the screen. This is part of a group that come on Sunday nights to the North Aurora campus. The big guy there with, uh, who's in the tan with the uh, brown sash is named Quincy. He played Jesus in the Easter extravaganza play. Uh, when he was in the resurrection story, when Jesus says, go tell my brothers that I'm risen, he's like, go tell my brothers. <laughs> and Quincy didn't even know Jesus a few months ago. And now he does through the ministry there. I, I, I just, it's so exciting to see. The next slide you'll see is the entire crew, some from our campus, from Mill Creek, and from North Aurora coming together for the Easter extravaganza at the North Aurora campus. If you attend here, you may never see that. But I want you to know when you're generous to the work of God, it's multiplied exponentially beyond our walls. And so I just want to say thank you for that. And I'm going to pray, and then we're going to begin by uh, singing together a remarkable song that will lead us in the text. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the way that you are generous to us. You pour out your grace in our lives every day. We, we rarely think about it. We take it for granted. But in this moment, we acknowledge that you are a generous God. All we have is a gift of your grace. We are not owners of everything. We're stewards of what you have given to us. And so now, Lord, we, we reflect that back in our lives, our financial resources, our time, our attention, our words, our service, all we give back to you in worship because of all that you've given us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He's the end of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. And by him all things were created, heaven and earth, seen and unseen, rulers, dominions, and powers and kings. He holds all things, all things, all things.
Yeah, don't worry, we're going to sing that again in this series. That song, if you didn't recognize it, comes right out of the passage we're going to be examining together this morning. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And so maybe you're not so down with singing, you're worried about your voice, but I'm going to ask you to stand together, and we're going to do what Christians have done down through the centuries in this passage. We're going to recite it as a creed, as a spoken hymn back to God about who he is and what he's done. Let's begin. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Amen. You may be seated. Spoiler alert, we're going to challenge you to memorize that passage over the next several weeks. So get to work. It's worth committing yourself to. Believe it or not, those words that you heard sung a minute ago, that's an Andrew Peterson song, which, Andrew, or which uh, Anton and Ricky performed beautifully for us, uh, uh, were actually an ancient hymn, to us ancient, but in the early days of the church, though Paul penned those words, and he may have been the originator of, the song, of that hymn, the early Christians would have known those words by heart. They would have recognized immediately, oh, I know this one. You ever hear that experience? You hear a couple notes on the radio and you go, I know this one. Maybe you could think of it like a theme song. What we, what we just recited, it was the theme song of Jesus, who he is and what he's done. You know, you know theme songs from the television shows or movies of your youth? You hear a couple lines, you know it immediately, right? You can sing the whole word. Let's play a little game to illustrate the point. Let's, I'm going to give you a note or two of a theme song, see if you can get it. Ready? Here comes the first one. Anybody? You know. Play a little more. Yes. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. If you're, if you're younger, you're like, what? Ask your parents. Right. Next one. Uh, you know it immediately. That's like three notes, and you do that one. We don't have to play the rest of it. How about this one? I wish you knew the Bible this well. Okay, your next one. Now this is a story all about how, right? You know those words. Okay. At the risk of being a little bit uh, silly. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Like a couple of notes and you know this. Last one. It's a story. of a Look at that. Seriously, what if we could recite Colossians 1, 15 to 20 this way? I play three notes, you're like, got that, got that, got that. By the way, I had a list of like 30 songs. We could just keep doing this, the whole sermon, but that would miss the point. It is amazing how quickly we know these words. Why? Because we repeated them. They're like ingrained. They're like the soundtrack of our childhood or our television watching. Well, I think the early Christians, when Paul wrote these words, we go, oh, I know this one. We sing it every week. I know this one. That's kind of the point. For this hymn is in Colossians, we don't know if Paul wrote it himself and he's quoting himself here in Colossians chapter 1 or if he's quoting a hymn that was already well known to them. I think Paul wrote it, but, I, but we don't know for sure. Whatever the case, New Testament scholars all agree this is a hymn that Paul wrote. Look at this quote from James D.G. Dunn, New Testament scholar. This passage can be clearly and confidently classified as a very early Christian hymn in which Christ is praised as God in language commonly used in Hellenistic Judaism in reference to divine wisdom. So the Hellenistic Jews in this region of the Lycus Valley, uh, where, where Colossians, Colossae was, talked about divine wisdom as the image of God. So Paul, or the hymn writer, are borrowing from this image of the day and saying, no, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He's how you know who God is. You'll see an image here on the screen of a map of Asia Minor. We looked at this last week. This is, shows you a little bit of what's going on here, and I want to point something out historically speaking. Here's Colossae, where we're talking about Paul wrote a letter to this town 
The major center here is Ephesus. But Paul writes to Colossae, which is about 110 miles to the east. And it's kind of a nothing town. It's diminishing in its economic and cultural influence by the time Paul writes to them. And a, a, a few years after he writes to them, that area, that region will be devastated by a massive earthquake. But, and Paul, by the way, is from Tarsus. We talked about that last week. But about 40 years after Paul wrote this letter, in this region up here, Bithynia, uh, the, governor, the Roman governor of that region, a guy named Pliny the Younger, wrote a letter to Emperor Trajan about whether or not he should keep killing Christians. Because at this time, 40 years after Paul wrote to the Colossians, the uh, Christians were being heavily persecuted in the Roman world, particularly in this region. Pliny the Younger, the governor of Bithynia and Pontus, Bithynia and Pontus, writes to Trajan saying, hey, uh, what's happening is neighbors are turning in neighbors for being Christian, accusing them of it. And I, and I have to interrogate them. And I'm not sure what to ask them. Uh, uh, to, uh, if, I know that if they're really Christian, they won't renounce their faith. And so, but I've done some investigations, and I'm not sure what their crimes are. Should I keep killing them, as the imperial decree said from a, 10 years ago? Here's what Pliny the Younger wrote in 112 AD to Emperor Trajan. However, they assured me that the main of their fault, Christian's fault, or their mistake was this. They were wont on a stated day to meet together before it was light and to sing a hymn to Christ as to God and to uh, oblige themselves by a sacrament or oath not to do anything that was ill. They would commit no theft, no pilfering, no adultery. They would not break their promises or deny what was required of them by their Lord, after which it was their custom to depart and meet again for a common meal. They sound terrible, don't they? <laughs> Notice what he says. Like, I've done some investigations. This is him writing to the emperor about his investigations about Christians. And all he could find out was, well, the thing that they're known for is meeting together early in the morning and singing a hymn to Christ as God, which was a crime because Caesar is Lord. Colossians 1, 15 to 20 is probably that hymn that they sang, or one very much like it. These early Christians being persecuted, meeting together before it's sunlight, singing what we just recited. A hymn to Christ as God. The very first Christians worshiped the Judean healer, teacher, the crucified and risen Messiah as God. as how you know what God is like and who he is. And this hymn, this passage is amazing. And it was crucial for their faith in the first century. And I would submit to you that it's crucial for yours today, for ours, which is why we're gonna memorize it together. I'm gonna challenge you that over the next several weeks as we go through Colossians to commit verses 15 through 20 to memory. You're probably thinking, I can't even remember my passwords to get online when I read, I, I get that. The key to, to memorization as we get older is repetition, which means you're gonna have to say it over and over again to yourself every day, which is a good thing, a really good thing. If you can sing the Brady Bunch, you can memorize Colossians 1, 15 to 20. One of the reasons Paul includes this hymn for the Colossians and for us, I think, is that it's a, it's a protection against all the false teachings and errors. Singing and saying this hymn of praise to Christ is a protection against all kinds of errors. Because clarity about who Jesus is and worshiping him as in truth guards our hearts against all kinds of false ideas about Jesus. Paul doesn't, notice that Paul, the, the Colossians were experiencing some, some infiltration of uh, different notions about Jesus and the gospel. And that happens today. And his response is not to trace down every error, to refute every false idea. His response is what? Call the people of God back to the real thing. Worship the truth. Focus your minds and hearts on who Jesus really is. That's the best protection against falsehood. In fact, I, would, I think what we see here, and we'll get to this in a few weeks, is that this hymn in verses 15 through 20 of chapter 1 is guarding against some errors he points out later in chapter 2, a couple of them just to point out quickly. Colossians 2, verses 8 through 9. See to it, no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition. Interesting phrase there, being taken captive by human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. 
and then verses 16 through 18. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So Paul says, listen, don't, don't get caught up in human traditions and, and new philosophies that are empty. Focus on Christ. And don't get taken, carried away with the, the shadow of, of things when the substance you already have in Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, who is Christ. We saw that in the hymn. He is the head of the body of the church. Now, these are some specifics for what the Colossians are are facing, but I think we could translate this to our day. In case you think I'm, I'm kidding, I think we all make Jesus in our own image, or we're tempted to. Just a couple of these that might be familiar to you. And if you're offended, well, frankly, good. (laughs) There there, there is the, uh, not because I want to offend anyone, but because sometimes Jesus needs to get our attention by shaking us up. There is the the life coach Jesus, or Dr. Phil Jesus. He's tough talking, dispenser of advice. And I think sometimes evangelicals love this Jesus because he's the solution for all their problems. He becomes less an object of worship and more of a means to an end. We go to him when we, we need a pep talk or some counsel. There's the American patriot Jesus. This is the patriotic national renewal. He's a mascot for the GOP. He, uh, he probably drives a Ford F-150 with a gun rack. The problem with this Jesus is not just that he's, he's been appropriate as a mascot, but he doesn't look like the Jesus of Scripture very often. There, there's the guru Jesus. Jesus of the Enlightenment, the Jesus who existed in human history, but is not nearly as radical as the Jesus of the Gospels. He's a gentle figure who has nice feathered hair, fits nicely alongside other religious titans like Buddha, Muhammad, Vishnu. He's a safe Jesus. He's just saying the same things everybody else is saying. There's left-wing Jesus. He drives a hybrid and he cares about uh, global warming. He's He's a mascot for progressive social causes. He's definitely anti-capitalist and has little interest in personal salvation by faith or faithfulness. There's a defense attorney Jesus. I, I've, I've known this one. You go to him when you're in trouble. Get me out of this, right? Get me, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll straighten up. There's BFF Jesus. When I was youth pastor, this was common, right? Kind of like uh, one of Taylor Swift's ex-boyfriends. We sing to him. And uh, we, we, he's close to us, and we, he makes us feel good about ourselves. There's retirement plan, Jesus. You know, you, you've got him in your pocket for when you get to heaven, but for the most part, he's not really, you know, you, you check now and then to see how it's going, but you're hoping he, you can cash that in when you, when you die. We could go right on down the list. And I, I, maybe you feel a little uncomfortable. Maybe you think, well, wait a second. Uh, my point is, we, we, from the time of the Colossians to right down to today, we all are in danger of remaking Jesus in our own image, crafting him to fit our ideology, our view of the world. And, and Paul sees that happening, although he's never been to Colossians, he hears about it, and he says, listen, I don't have time or the energy, and it wouldn't even be that helpful to trace down every error. What I can tell you is to bring your mind and your heart back into set focus and clarity on who Jesus really is. And the best way to do that is to say it over and over and over again to yourself. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, whether in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. And he's before all things and in him all things hold together. That's my Jesus. That's the one I, we worship. And don't get off track. It's so easy to do. So I want to look at three ways this passage helps us focus on and worship the one true Jesus Christ. First, praise for the glorious identity of Christ. Think think of their their reciting and probably singing this passage. And it's not praising to Jesus, it's praise about him. Praise for the glorious identity of Christ. Let's look at verses 15 through 17 of the passage. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So what has he created? Class? 
It's not a trick question. It shows up everywhere. All things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, like there's nothing you can conceive of that he hasn't brought into being. All things were created through him and for him, and he's before all things, and in him everything holds together. Let's walk through this passage a little bit and talk about it. He's the image of the invisible God. We're made in God's image. So you and I are images of God, but we're imperfect images of God. There's only one who is the perfect image of God, who is how you see and know what God is like. Jesus said to Philip, when Philip says, show us the Father, and Jesus says, I've been with you this long, and you ask me that question, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Philip. You're looking at him, in other words. We use the phrase, the spitty image of, right? Jesus is the image of the Father. He is God in flesh. 1 Timothy 1, verse 17 tells us this. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God is invisible. The Old Testament tells us no one can see God. The New Testament says he's made visible. You could not know God if God did not want himself to be known by you. And he's made himself known to you primarily in the person of Jesus Christ. The image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3 tells us he's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Same phrases, right? Holds all things together, holds it by word of his power. The exact imprint of his nature is a way of translating the word image. Image is the Greek word icon. It means the exact representation of, perfect reflection. The exact imprint of his nature. Doesn't mean that God looks like Jesus of Nazareth with flesh. It means his character, his nature. That's how you know what the Father is like. It, do you know it's common? I hear this all the time for people to think, well, the God of the Old Testament seems angry and distant and grumpy, but Jesus seems really nice. I like him better. Paul's saying they are the same. There is no incongruity here. You're looking at Jesus. You're looking at who the Father is. That's what he's like. He doesn't change like shifting shadows. Not of a different character. The immortal and invisible God has made himself known to us in Jesus Christ. Now, then it says, go back to one slide if we can. He's the firstborn of all creation. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses, if you've ever had any interactions with them, they'll try to use this passage to say, well, see, Jesus is created. He's a created being. He's the first of creation, but he's created being. In fact, they used to come to my door many years ago, and we would have lots of, they don't come, come anymore. So, but we'd go bound, round and round about this. Well, first of all, it can't mean this, because look at the next line. For by him all things were created. How can a created person be the one who creates everything? It, it, it's clearly not talking about him being a created being. He's before all things, verse 17 says. He's eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. And the phrase firstborn is the Greek word prototokos, and it it, it doesn't mean like birth order. It means preeminent, supreme, uh, the first of, over. Not coming from God, but overall creation. He's the firstborn over creation, for everything comes from him. Everything that exists was created by him and through him and for him. This is a phrase I want you to see. This this phrase, for years I never really saw this, but it's really encouraged me over the years recently as I think about this. All things were created through him and for him. I want you to think about that. Everything that exists came into being because Jesus made it so. uh, Scholars and scientists tell us that the human eye on a good, clear night not, not in Chicago with the pollution and so on, but you get to a place, maybe you've been out at sea or you've been a part of the, of the world where the stars are really bright. And on a clear night, without a lot of uh, other lights, uh, you can, and the sky is not cloudy, you can see about 5,000 stars with the naked eye. We live in the Milky Way galaxy, which is a small to mid-sized galaxy in the universe. And there are roughly 400 billion stars in our own galaxy approximately two trillion galaxies in the universe. Remember, we count billions, trillions, right? So he, there's two trillion galaxies in the known universe. If we use the Milky Way as a, as a model, because galaxies vary in sizes, 
there's 400 billion stars in our galaxies and 2 trillion galaxies in the universe, then there are approximately 200 billion trillion stars in the universe, or 200 sextillion. Beyond comprehension is the point. And by the way, one molecule of water a handful of water, the molecules in, a, in like a few drops of water in your hand, if you can hold it in your hand, or in the very bottom of your glass when you have just a little bit left in there, has more molecules of H2O than the 200 sextillion stars in the universe. So what are we told? Whether things in heaven or on earth, all things are made through him. This is who we're talking about. This is not the Jesus, my self-help Jesus, my guru Jesus, my politically aligned Jesus. This is the creator of all that exists, every molecule in your body. And the, the, the phrase that really gets me is, for him. The universe was created not for you. Is that a surprise to you? Is it disappointing? But I thought I was at the center. Like our kids, right? We have to teach our kids you're not at the center of the universe. And we have to teach adults that, quite frankly. I have to relearn that. No, you're not. All things were created for him, including you. Every star, every grain of sand, every water molecule, every atom in your body created for him. You were created for him, to know him, to be in relationship with him. He made you for him, not for yourself, for your own comfort, for your own security, for your own agenda. That's so small-minded. It's going to be gone like that. He made you for him, whether you want to acknowledge that or not. You exist for him, Paul's saying. This hymn we would sing over and over again. All things, including me, my life, my body, what, what makes me, me, he made. Why? For him for his glory, for his purpose. And then this phrase, in him all things hold together, which is the phrase in the song we, we heard sung a moment ago, right? I like to think of this as Jesus is the glue of the universe. Without him, everything just flies apart. Remember Thanos in the Infinity Wars? When he snaps his fingers, they just go, which is ridiculous, but in my mind, I, maybe this is just me, nerdy. I think of this like, without Jesus, we just fly apart. Everything does. He holds everything together by a word of his power. Do you know that uh, the, the, um, cosmologists and astrophysicists tell us that 85% of the matter in the universe is not visible? Do you know what they call it? Dark matter. Do you know where it is? Neither do they. They don't know. They, they, they can't observe it by, it by, it doesn't respond to electromagnetic pulses and light the way other matter does. The only way they observe or, or they actually theorize that it exists is the way that uh, it, its effect gravitationally on the visible matter of the universe, 15% that they can see with electromagnetic light. So they think that 85% of the matter in the universe is invisible to the eye or to detectable by, by telescopes, but it exists because of the way it impacts gravitationally other matter, quite frankly, holding it together. You know what I think? They're just beginning to understand what Paul said in Colossians chapter 2. In him, all things hold together. And it's beyond our comprehension, but it's true. And by the way, friends, that means he's holding you together. I don't just mean the atoms of your body. I mean your life. I mean your family. I mean your, your thoughts. He's holding, even when you feel like I'm coming apart, he's holding you together. Even when you think, I can't hold it together, he can, and he is. Right now, as I speak, he's holding you together. Without him, you'd be coming apart, figuratively and literally. He's holding us together. It's easy to forget that God, this is the God far beyond our small ideas of him, beyond my ability even to declare Take a minute for just a second and find your pulse. Can you do that with me? Take a deep breath. See if you can find your pulse. Mine is going pretty fast right now. You feel it? Maybe your neck if you need to. Can you feel it? Until I just said this, you probably didn't, weren't even aware. You weren't thinking about it, right? Who's, who's making that happen? Boom, 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 boom. He is. He's holding together. Take some breath with me.
who's doing that. You've been, you've been breathing since you walked in here, but weren't thinking about it. He's holding you together. Your heartbeat, your breath, everything that exists in him. This is the God we worship. If he can do that, he can hold the things you stress about together. You can trust him with it. Okay, second, praise for the supreme authority of Christ. Praise for the supreme authority of Christ. If Jesus is the immortal, eternal creator of all that exists, then he's in charge, and we're not. Look at verses 18 through 19. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So he's the head of the church, not like the queen, or in this case now the king, I keep forgetting about Charles. I think the rest of Britain does too. But anyway, he's the figurative, symbolic head of the church. It's not a symbolic head. Jesus is the head of his church. He said in Matthew 16, I'm gonna build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail. I'm gonna build it. I feel convicted by this every day. I'm not building his church. He's building it. If he uses me and us to do it, praise him that we get to be part of it but he's building it. He's the head of his church. Capital C, wherever you find it, in different expressions all over the planet. And small C, Chapel Street Church. This church, he's the head. He is the literal, functional head. We defer to him. At least we should. We must. He's the head of his church. And by the way, if, I, if you didn't believe this, that he's the head of his church, he's in charge. When you, when you just... I know this is weird for a lead pastor to say this, but when you look at the news and the, the story after story after story of, of pastors and people in Christian leadership failing miserably, you just want to give up. You just want to go, well, what, what's the point? He's the head. Praise God, he is the head. We can trust him. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That means he's the beginning of something new that God is doing in the world. We'll get to this in a minute. He's the firstborn from the dead, the first, the first evidence of new creation. Why? Because he's preeminent. He's over everything. The first. The preeminent, the Greek word means first place supreme. It's a good question to ask ourselves. Is, is Jesus Christ first place and supreme in my heart? in your heart. We could, we could go on, but we'll just skip to the next part here. Last, praise for the redeeming work of Christ. I think this, I love the way the hymn ends. Praise for the redeeming work of Christ. It's because Jesus is fully and completely and exclusively God that he has all authority and that we can trust and rely on him to forgive us, to restore us, to reconcile us, and to redeem us. I love how this hymn ends. Look at verse 20. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Remember that phrase, the song, he made peace, he made peace by the blood of his cross. All that he brought into existence has been corrupted and damaged by sin. I don't have to explain this to you, you see it every day. It's tainted, it's gone wrong, and it needs to be set right. And no nation or government or program or economy or a system can set it right. Because we're the problem. The virus is in us. And our best efforts fall short. Only the one who made it perfect and good can redeem it and restore it and reconcile it. And he will. And actually he has. How? By the blood of his cross. That's what Paul says. He's done this. Some, some have used this to mean that, oh, well, does this mean all things? Like all, does it mean like Satan gets reconciled? All things, everything created, like even those who reject God, even the, the, those who would do evil and never uh, repent and trust in Christ, that everyone's eventually brought in? That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying everything in creation will eventually be brought back under the reign and the rule of the one who made it. Some willingly. Some unwillingly. Like, for example, when, when the allies... On, on stormed the beach of Normandy and swept through Europe, right? S some were liberated because they've been longing for this. I'm set free. Others, because they're conquered. All things eventually brought back under his rule and reign. 
is what Paul is saying here. The redeeming work of Christ. It's a hint of, of what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 23, briefly. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In the hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Paul in Colossians is saying this is happening in Christ. To those who surrender and trust in him, all things restored. And then he applies it after the hymn to the Colossians and to us in verses 21 through 23. Here's what he says. And you, 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 who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he's now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Don't shift from the hope of the gospel. Don't veer off from the one true, crucified, risen, and reigning Jesus. Don't settle for a lesser version of who he is. Hold fast to him, for in him all things hold together. So I'm gonna ask us to finish the way we started by reciting this together, Colossians 1, 15 through 20, and then we'll close by worshiping our God. Let's read this together once more. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Amen. As always, if you're here this morning and like someone to pray for you or pray with you, members of our prayer team are available right back in the glass room. We'd love to encourage you through prayer. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the one who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. All things were made through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him everything holds together. Amen. And go in peace.